Hello, good morning and welcome to Castro in the Classroom. Thank you for joining us for this session, The Big Bang, How to Make a Universe. Our presenter today is Dr Luke Barnes from the University of Sydney. So he'll give you a presentation. If you think of any questions to ask during the session, please save them up to the end and we'll have time, about 10 or 15 minutes for question and answer at the end. So I'll leave you now and please welcome Dr Luke Barnes. All right. Hello, everyone. Thanks for clapping. I can't hear you, but I can see that. Thanks very much. Uh, so, yeah, we're going to be talking about the Big Bang, but first let me just uh, introduce myself quickly. Um, so I am an Australian. I grew up in country New South Wales in a little town called Maxville, which is halfway between Sydney and Brisbane. Um, uh, when I finished high school, I went to the University of Sydney and did what's called a Bachelor of Science in Physics. Uh, so I did that with honours, so that took four years. Um, that was uh, fantastic, and as a result of that, I wanted to do more. And so when you want to be a scientist, they make you do what's essentially a, a, a science apprenticeship. Uh, hello, third school, work on the board. Um, uh, so that's what's called a PhD, and I was lucky enough to get a, um, a scholarship to go to England, to the University of Cambridge, and do a PhD there, uh, specifically in the branch of physics called astronomy. Uh, so I studied how galaxies form and had a wonderful time playing uh, cricket at all hours of the day. Uh, I then got my first job, which was at a as a researcher at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, which is in Zurich in Switzerland, uh, which is an insanely beautiful country. Uh, I was called, what's called a postdoctoral researcher, so once you've got your PhD, you get to call yourself doctor, and then you can get a job actually doing uh, research and getting paid for it. Um, and I was there for two years, and then I came back to the University of Sydney and was a postdoctoral researcher here. Um, in Sydney, where, where I am at the moment. Um, so that's a bit about me and how I got to where I am. If you've got questions about that, if you want to ask about academic pathways, that's fine. Um, but we're here to talk about the Big Bang. So the Big Bang theory is a, uh, an idea we have about the universe, about what it's like uh, overall and what it was like in the past. So it's basically the statement that the universe as a whole is expanding that it is making more space, that everything is getting further apart as you go with time, as you can see on that diagram there. Um, so uh, in the past, if you sort of turn that around, it means that everything was closer together, uh, everything was also hotter. Now, uh, on the face of it, that's a pretty odd thing to believe about the universe, so what I want to run through today are just three reasons why we believe that that's roughly what our universe is like. So, uh, but first, before I get to that, I need to, to explain that word theory. So the Big Bang Theory, as the name suggests, is a theory. Now, in science, um, in, in everyday life, we say that something is a theory or something is a fact, depending on how certain you are. If you're really certain about something, it's a fact, but if you're not very certain, it's just a theory. That's not how we use the word in science. In science, a theory is an idea about how the universe works as a whole, or maybe just how part of it, maybe how atoms work, but it's saying what, what's really going on behind the scenes, and then a fact is what we say about something we observe about the universe. So if you go outside at night, you will see bright points of light in the sky. That is a fact. That is just something we observe about the universe. Okay? The theory is that uh, stars are balls of gas burning billions of miles away. That's a theory. That's something we have to go and test using our observations of the universe. So um, they're two different types of things. They don't become one another. When a th there are theories that are well supported by the evidence, which scientists keep on using, and there are theories that are not well supported by the evidence. Um, but at no point does a theory become a fact. They're just completely different things. So the Big Bang Theory is, is a theory. It's, it's saying about what the universe is and what the universe was like. And so here's three reasons why we, we think that the universe was like that. So the first one um, invites us to think about, you might just naively think, as you look up at the night sky, that the universe is just totally filled with uh, stars in all directions. So there's us in the middle, there's the blue circle, and there's just stars uh, all over the night sky. But if you think about looking out onto the universe and looking further and further out, 
uh, if you sort of zoom out a bit, there's more stars to see. And if you keep zooming out even further, you start to realize that if whatever direction I look, surely I would hit a star eventually. And so there's a nice little sort of uh, video here of that. This is called Olber's Paradox. So suppose that the universe was infinitely large and totally filled everywhere with stars, and it doesn't matter if they're just randomly scattered around or they're in galaxies, it doesn't much matter. Suppose they're all just sitting there, it's all static, and that the universe is infinitely old as well. Suppose that you could see as far as you want in the universe. So light only moves at a certain speed. Uh, so when you look out into the universe, you're effectively looking back in time. So infinitely old just means I can look as far as I like. In that case, what this uh, video is going to show is suppose you had a star which is close, and then you consider stars further and further away. As you keep looking further and further away, they will start to fill in the gaps between all the other stars. Now, the fact that they're further away means they look smaller, but there are more of, and more and more of them. So if we could see infinitely far, and the universe was just full of stars, then the entire night sky would be as bright as a star. That is called Olber's Paradox. What we do with that, see this is a theory, right? One, two, three. The universe is infinitely large, filled everywhere with stars, it's static, it just sits there, and it's infinitely old. We thought about that theory, and we got a prediction, which is that the whole night sky would be as bright as a star, and that prediction is wrong. So one of those things has to go. They can't all be true. One of them's got to be wrong. Now, that doesn't tell us to believe the Big Bang Theory yet, but it tells us that that simple picture of there's just a universe with stars all over the place and it's just always been sitting there, that's wrong. Something about that has to change. So that's fact number one. Uh, moving on to fact number two is due to a guy called Edwin Hubble. There he is there back in the days when uh, you smoked a pipe and you were allowed to smoke a pipe when you were uh, at the telescope. Uh, not the fact, not the case these days. Um, Edwin Hubble discovered something about the universe. So to explain this, I need you to understand what the Doppler effect is. Now just by show of hands, I can sort of see you up there. Who knows what the Doppler effect is? Who knows what the Doppler effect is thanks to the TV show, The Big Bang Theory? Yeah? Right. Okay. Um, you're all familiar with the Doppler effect, even if you don't know the name. Uh, when you hear, a, say, an ambulance going past with its siren on, you'll notice that the pitch of it lowers as it goes past you. So, or a, a car, as a car goes past you, will go, will, the pitch will lower. So it will go... Um, if you want to waste some time after this, stick the words ski and trombone into YouTube, and you'll hear a guy skiing down a mountain playing a trombone, and as he passes you, the, the pitch of the trombone goes down. It's hilariously funny. Um, so, the Doppler effect we can think of as, uh, in terms like this, so when I make a sound, a, a sphere of, of sound wave heads out. Okay, so that's what this is showing in two dimension. If I then run after that sound wave and click again, the next circle of sound waves going out is compressed at the front and uh, rarefied, it's not as compressed behind. So, the closeness of those sound waves is, gives you the pitch of the sound. So that's why it's higher when it's coming at you, when they're closer together, a high note, and then a low note when it goes past you. That's with sound. The same thing happens with light. Except instead of being the pitch, it's the colour. So if you had a skiing trombonist flying towards you at almost the speed of light, as he came towards you he would look blue, and as he went away from you he would look red. Okay, what Hubble did was went out into the universe and studied and looked at all the galaxies around us. And what he noticed was that a lot of them were red. Actually, the vast majority of them looked red, which means that they're moving away from us, right? If, if they were instead you know, playing a sound, that sound would be quite low. What he also noticed was that how red they are depends on how far away they are. So if we say that the redness tells us how fast it's moving, the things that are further away are moving faster. So the universe, just uh, in a one-dimensional picture, looks, looks a bit like this. So suppose these are all galaxies, sort of lined up in a line, artificially. The one that's, here's us in the middle, 
The one that's close is moving at a certain speed. If you're twice as far away, you're moving twice as fast. If you're three times further away, you're moving three times as fast. And so as the universe expands, as time goes on, the whole thing expands like that. Now the interesting thing about this particular type of way that the universe is moving is, suppose that you were, let's just rewind, suppose you were on that galaxy. Then you'd see this guy moving at a certain speed that way, and you'd see that guy going twice as fast, and that guy three times as fast. So this type of motion looks the same no matter where you are. So we aren't in the middle of the universe watching everything go away from us, right? It's not that the Big Bang happened here and flew everything out. It's more like the surface of a, a balloon expanding. If you drew dots on the balloon and then made it expand, every, every dot would move away from every other dot and it would look the same no matter where you were. So it doesn't matter where you are in the universe, it always looks a bit like this. So that's why we say the universe is expanding. It's not just that things are moving away from us. It has this, this character of uh, as if it was just attached to the surface of a balloon. So that's fact number two. Uh, fact number three is something called the cosmic microwave background, which is incredibly important in the study of the universe, in, uh, in cosmology. So I, I, I've told my... My uni students, if you're stuck for an answer and you have no idea, just say cosmic microwave background uh, because it's the most likely answer anyway and I'll just be happy that you think that the answer is the cosmic microwave background. So let me tell you what that is. Um, as you look out into the night sky, what you see depends on the wavelength that you look at. So yeah, uh, the wavelength of light is basically its colour, so within the range that your eyes can see, Long wavelengths are red and short wavelengths are blue, but the spectrum continues off in either direction. So radio waves are just very long light rays. So the light that you see and radio waves is the same stuff, it's just the wavelength. All right? So what you see of the universe depends on what wavelength you're looking at. If you look out with your eyes, you will see something like that the night sky that we're familiar with, the bright band across the middle is the Milky Way, you are, in the, you are in the middle of a disk of stars, so there's a particular plane, and if you look in that plane you'll see a lot more stars. If you get out a radio telescope and look at the night sky, you'll see something different. This uh, is a particular radio wave which looks at uh, light from neutral hydrogen, just atoms that are just hanging around, they're not in stars or anything, they're just sort of hanging around between the stars, that strong red band in the middle is our galaxy again, but now it looks totally different and you can see these sort of streams of neutral hydrogen up above the plane. This, by the way, this is supposed to be the whole night sky. So if you've ever seen a world map, that's sort of looking down, the entire sphere of the world projected onto a map. So Australia would be here and, you know, America's over here. This is the whole night sky. This is the same thing but looking up, okay? So this is the whole night sky just projected onto a, 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 a flat screen. The cosmic microwave background looks like this. There is a certain wavelength, and if you look at the night sky in that wavelength, it looks almost perfectly smooth. So you'll notice this looks very different to the other one. It just looks like static, if you've ever seen an old TV. And it basically is static. And the interesting thing is it's really, really smooth, ridiculously smooth. So these represent areas. The red bits are where the, uh, the light is slightly more energetic and the blue bits are where it's slightly less energetic, but the difference is only one part in a hundred thousand. So really, if we just, if you had eyes and you were looking, if you had, you know, cosmic microwave background eyes and you could look at that, it would be, it would look almost perfectly flat, just a completely boring matte picture. Now, the really interesting thing about the cosmic microwave background is what it tells us about the universe, okay? Um, if you go and take a survey of all this light and say how much of it is high, really energetic and how much of it is slightly less energetic, you can sort of build a picture of there's this much uh, you know, low energy and a bit more high energy. If you put all of that in the form of a, what's called a histogram, which hopefully you're familiar with, it looks like this. Now the important thing about this is... Uh, the bars there, the vertical bars, are the data. That's what we actually see. Those are the facts, right? The line going through the middle there 
is the theory. And the fact that it goes exactly through all those lines is fantastic, right? It means we're doing something right. In particular, that line was uh, derived, the mathematical equation there was derived uh, 90 years before the data got put on that plot by a guy called Max Planck. And he made a very specific model for why that particular line looks like that. You know, as a physicist, we've seen that shape before. This shape, we're very, very familiar with. You get that shape when the matter, the stuff, and the light, the radiation, are perfectly intermingled and are scattering off each other and everything has the same energy. So if you let matter and light come into that equilibrium state perfectly, where everything's lovely and mixed and uh, the average energy of a particle is the same as the average energy of, of a, a particle of light, that's when you get exactly this. The reason why that's so interesting is that the universe today will not do this. If you just looked at the universe today, there is not enough stuff and it is not dense enough and there is not enough radiation bouncing around to have the conditions you need for that curve. Which tells us something tells us that in the past the universe was different, right? This curve tells us that at some point in the past matter and radiation were perfectly mixed together, perfectly exchanging energy. So what that means is that in the past they must have had those conditions and those conditions are specifically if things are denser, if everything's really tightly knit together, that would happen and it would also help if things were a lot hotter. But as we saw before from our last clue, in the past we think that the universe, everything was closer together. If you run that movie backwards, everything gets closer. So there's denser, and it will also heat up as, as you turn things around. So this is another piece of that puzzle. This makes us think that in the past, the universe was not only very smooth, but very hot and very dense. So everything was closer in together, everything was more tightly packed. So those are the three pieces of information. So what we can do now with that information is as follows. We can reconstruct the history of the universe. We can do it on average. So what this plot shows is the time. So if you just let the universe evolve. And this is called the scale of the universe. So suppose today we call that one. Lay out all your galaxies in a line. And we say, how long ago, at the rate that things are moving, and given how gravity is moving stuff around, how long ago was everything half the distance away. So we can go down this plot, there's one, so we want a half, there's a half, we go over, and we read it off, and so today is about 13.8 billion years, so say 14 billion years, so half's about 6 billion years, so it was 8 billion years ago. We can reconstruct the history of the universe in this particular way. One particular thing we can do, which is great, is not just look at the overall average properties of the universe, but look at it in detail. We can start off with the picture we get of the universe from the cosmic microwave background, that things at the beginning were smooth, and they were hot, and they were dense. And we can say, okay, if there's a small lump of stuff, then gravity will make it collapse even further. So if I've got a lump of stuff here, it will, it will collect the stuff around it, because gravity is always attractive. If that were the only thing that happened in the universe, then eventually, as gravity brought things in, the pressure of the gas, like the pressure inside a balloon, would fight gravity. And so all you would get is a great big hot ball of gas. That's not what we see in the universe. So we need the gas to cool off to let gravity win even further to crush it down into a rotating um, galaxy. Once that happens, within that rotating sphere, stars will form. and But then they will feed back, right? So once a star fires up, you've suddenly got something which is really bright and just pumping out energy into the universe, which will push things away from where that star formed. But then they might uh, make things even more dense over here, so stars will form over there. So there's sort of a feedback loop. Stars, stars will form, but stars will push things around, which will make small stars somewhere else, but might pro prohibit stars somewhere else. We can take all of this, we can stick it in a computer, uh, and we can hit go on a simulation of how we think the universe would evolve. Uh, if we tried to do it on your average desktop computer, it would take about 500 years, so we don't do that. We get 4,000 computers, which is what I'm showing you on the screen, and we run them for a month and a half. 
and we hope that nothing happens to the computer in that month and a half. So I once came into work to find an email from the National Computing Infrastructure that included the word vaporized. The computer on which I was running my simulation had had a power surge which literally vaporized the power cord. And it was, this was not your average power cord, it was about that thick. And it was just in two pieces. Anyway, I'll, enough about my problem. When this works, as it hopefully does, uh, it looks like this. So this is a simulation of what we think the universe will look like. Uh, the expansion of the universe has been sort of factored out. So this is what's happening on top of that. But you can see from that sort of staticky beginning, gravity is starting to pull things together. Gravity is starting to make the dense bits of the universe particularly dense. Once that happens, what you can see there exploding are stars that get to the end of their lives and blow up. So in the densest, hottest bits of the universe, stars will form and then they will feed back on the, the stuff around them. What you're starting to see now is what's called the cosmic web. So the universe will take the sort of random pattern and will squish stuff together. So it will, if you've just got a random blob of gas, it will squish it into sort of a pancake. Uh, and then the shorter side of the pancake will collapse into a filament. You can see all sorts of filaments running through the universe there. And then at the intersection of these filaments is the densest bits of the universe where we think that galaxies will form. So that is that simulation. Now, what we really want to know is, at the end of the day, did we make anything that looks like a galaxy? Let me just do this. So what we're going to do now is take one of those simulations and zoom in. So that last simulation was zoomed right out, way bigger than any particular galaxy. Right? So it's a massive scale there. Like a particular, uh, the Milky Way galaxy, for example, has 100 billion stars in it. Right? And we've zoomed way out bigger than even that scale. So now let's take that simulation and zoom right in on one of those knots. And let's see what happens and see if anything that looks remotely like a galaxy will form. So we can see uh, gravity pulling things together. The one on the right is the products of star formation. So that's kind of interesting. If, if stars burn, some, burn things to the, and then shoot them out, where do those things end up? But watch the one on the left. Uh, as we continue the simulation on, you can see that as things fall in, they start to rotate because they don't all just collapse straight into the center. And at the end, we hopefully have something that looks sort of roughly like a galaxy. It's rotating. It's flat, there's a disk there, it's got that flat morphology, and conditions are dense enough in the out of, outskirts of that galaxy that uh, stars will start to form. That was kind of pretty, so I'm going to watch, play it again. Uh, why not? So you see gravity, once again, gravity's pulling things in, and then as things start to collapse down those filaments coming in from the right and the left, however it, it's oriented at your screen, they don't perfectly hit the middle, so instead of just all ramming into each other, they spin the whole thing up. And once the whole thing's spinning, anything else that comes in just sort of gets dragged around. And that is the end. So there's, there's a sort of summary of where, uh, what, what cosmology is doing these days. We've a sort of reasonable idea of what the universe looks like. On a, on a big scale, we're trying to refine our knowledge of that. Hang on, I'll play that again in a second. We've got good reasons to think that something like that was what, how the universe started, that the Big Bang is a rough picture of what, what happened. We still don't know exactly what happened at the very beginning, but we're working on that too. And in particular, we want to know where galaxies and stars and planets and all those sorts of things fit into this whole picture. And I'll leave you with another uh, look at this very pretty video. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Luke. Um, I hope you enjoyed that presentation. I love those simulations. They're quite beautiful. Um, like I said, we do have some time for questions now. So I sort of took the long way. Uh, I wasn't totally sure what to do out of high school, so I did a year of uh, surveying degree at the University of New South Wales. Did first year physics there and thought, no, oh, no, I'm going to do physics, just surveying stuff, never mind. Um, so my undergraduate degree was uh, three years to get a bachelor and then one year to get a uh, honours. Uh, 
Um, I then went to Cambridge for three years, and so that's seven years in total, although it took me slightly longer than that because of various other reasons. But that's, that's kind of standard, a four-year undergraduate degree, maybe master's or honours or something, uh, and then uh, PhD is usually about, the doctorate is usually about three or four years. Do the galaxies speed up their rate of spin as they age? Generally, yes, because they're growing. So uh, how fast you're spinning is really determined by... So yeah, I mean, you can go a long way in astrophysics by just asking the question, what's fighting gravity? So gravity's always trying to push things in. Uh, so if nothing's fighting gravity, you've just got yourself a black hole. Uh, in a galaxy, what fights is that, is that rotation around. So if the galaxy gets bigger, as, it's, as you can see in these videos, as things start to... Uh, let me run that again, because that was fun. Um, as things start to grow and get bigger and heavier, they'll need to spin faster in order to sort of hold back the, the collapse of gravity. So generally they do, although uh, there's, there's a, an initial phase where things grow quite quickly, and then uh, galaxies generally just have a sort of a, a middle age where not much happens. They accrete a few things onto themselves, but uh, they'll generally just keep the same rotations. Great question. Um, these simulations usually don't run past today because we're trying to... I mean, we really want to understand what happened in the past to understand how things look today. So most of them will stop today. Um, there have been a few that run forward. Uh, actually trying to run a few of those myself at the moment for various reasons. Um, the, the general trend of things continues that you get a higher... So uh, the way things form in our universe is what's called hierarchical. You can sort of see it there. If you want to make a big thing, you first make smaller things and then you whack them together. So you make a big galaxy out of small galaxies. That will keep on happening, making larger and larger galaxies until... Uh, what we know about our universe is that the rate at which it's expanding is actually accelerating. It's not just getting bigger, it's getting bigger at a faster and faster rate. Um, what that means is eventually things are moving a apart so fast that gravity can't draw them together anymore. That expansion of the universe outwards uh, is, is too fast for gravity to take a hold of things. So at some point in the future... Uh, 10 or 20 billion years-ish, so, you know, don't worry about it. But uh, this process will basically grind to a halt. Galaxies will cease to form, and then every galaxy is kind of its own isolated thing. It's on its own. It will burn gas into stars. Stars will blow up, uh, and the universe will start sort of grinding down to a halt. Okay, thank you for that question. Please join me in thanking Luke for his presentation today. Excellent. Thanks a lot, everyone. Bye.